I'm Gautam. I'm from UCSD. Uh, I'm a grad student, and I work in the group of Massimo Vergasola at UCSD. And uh, what I'm going to be talking about is quite different from what we've heard uh, in, this, in this conference. Uh, what we're interested in is machine learning in biology, right? And machine learning in biology is nothing new. Bioinformaticians have been using machine learning in biology for a long time. But what we're doing is something different. We are interested in animal behavior and understanding animal behavior. One grand challenge in behavior is to quantitatively describe behavior. For instance, what you would like to do is to look at uh, an animal's past and kind of predict what it could do in the future, given a particular task. Right? And the task we're interested in is soaring. Right? So birds soar. They use atmospheric currents to gain height. And uh, they, they do this to save energy. And this is a phenomenon that we're interested in. And when we talk about behavior, it's useful to uh, think about understanding biological behavior in terms of uh, three levels of analysis. So you have the computational level, which is basically the computational task that the animal is trying to solve. right? And then given a computational task, the animal uses an algorithm to solve the task. right? So this is something that we all do. And then for a particular algorithm, you have some biological implementation to perform that, uh, to execute that algorithm. So the implementation essentially has uh, most of the typical biology that we think of, the neural circuitry, the physiology, and so on. And of course, there's, there's some kind of constraints imposed by the physics of the environment. You have computational constraints imposed by your, the neuroscience of, of the animal's brain. You have physiological constraints. I mean, you have two limbs. You have to make do with certain things, right? What, what I'm interested in is basically the top two parts. So we are interested in, in the computation, computational and algorithmic aspects of animal behavior, right? So we don't, we don't explicitly focus on the implementation. We just understand what constraints this imposes on the animal and just study the top two parts. One general approach in this, these kind of problems is to think about what is called an ideal agent. Right? So you, you define something called an ideal agent which maximizes or does the computational task the best way. And the hope is that this can tell you something about how animals do it. Right? So this is a way of generating hypothesis for experiments. And one question is whether you can use artificial intelligence as a way uh, to generate an ideal agent which does this task very well. So right, uh, coming to the talk itself, so we are interested in what's called thermal soaring. This is what birds do very often. So once you know about this, and if you see birds, if you see eagles especially, they're almost always gliding, right? So they, they're not flapping their wings. What they're using is uh, atmospheric convective currents, right, uh, to gain height. So the strategy is, is as follows. What they do is they find a current, they go up, and then they glide down to the next uh, thermal, find it, uh, go up, and so on. And this way they can migrate long distances. So this is a video of a soaring falcon. It has a GPS on top of it. Right? So it's going along. Uh, the colors are the wind velocity, the vertical wind velocity, and now it finds a thermal. Right? It begins to spiral up. And this is what we're interested in. And this is an important, important behavior for animals. So if you look at the migration routes for, of soaring birds, uh, these exclusively stick to land. And this is because this is where you find thermals, right? Thermals form because the land gets hot relative to the surrounding air, and you have convection. So what we'll be focusing on is the problem of navigating within a single thermal. So there's the other problem of how you navigate within thermals and uh, between thermals. So we are very interested in a single thermal. Sorry? Um, this one? Yeah. The one Jeff. This one? Yeah, this one's go going through the sea, but I suspect it's short enough that it can flap for a long time. So the cost is, there's a very strong cost to flapping. 
which they should avoid. But there's also another way of soaring uh, through the oceans called dynamic soaring. That's that's a bit different. So the question we would like to answer is how do birds find and navigate thermals, right? And the one question you can ask is what quantities should a bird sense? Should it sense the vertical wind velocities or the temperature or the gradients in the, in the velocities and the temperature or so on? And what kind of strategy should it use, right? So this is the other question you could ask. Now, the issue with doing experiments is basically they're impossible to control in these kind of situations. You have no way of inferring what the bird is actually sensing, right? So it's, it's, it's impossible to do experiments when you don't know what you're looking for in behavioral studies. So what you'd like to ask instead is, how does an optimal agent navigate thermals? So can you teach an agent to navigate thermals? And you can ask what kind of sensory information does it use, right? So that's, that's the approach that we're going to use. And of course, in order to use this approach, we have to define what's our environment. We have to define the physics of the agent and then we had to teach it to navigate thermals. So if you think about the aerodynamics of a gliding bird, this is very similar to the aerodynamics of a hang glider or a sailplane, right? So it's, it's pretty well understood. Essentially, you have two ways to control the glider. You have a bank angle, which controls where you're headed, and you have the angle of attack. The angle of attack essentially controls how fast you sink. Sorry, this is not working. How fast you sink relative to how fast you move. Right? So you have something called a polar curve. Each bird has a different polar curve. And basically by modulating the angle of attack, you can go up along the curve. Right? So you can choose your speed and how fast you sink. And our agent, we give our agent essentially two ways to control its uh, motion, the bank angle and the angle of attack. And now if you think about convection in the atmosphere, uh, you have if, if, if the, on, a, on a good sunny day, you, do, you, you have thermal formation. Uh, you can model this using rayleigh Bernard convection. So you can write down uh, the Navier-Stokes equations coupled with the temperature field. Right? And if there's two dimensionless parameters, the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number, and if the Rayleigh number is large enough, then you have instabilities and you have the formation of thermals. Right? This is pretty simple. It's just buoyancy uh, and temperature gradients. So you can, you can uh, simulate this, uh, you can do direct numerical simulations, and the vertical velocity fields look like this. So the red is up, upward and blue is downward. So what you're seeing here is essentially a convective cycle, which you might have seen in textbooks where you see a cycle of uh, convection in the formation of clouds, right? But it's, it's extremely turbulent. And this is really numbers of 10 to the 8, the atmosphere has 10 to the 20, so it's way more turbulent. And of course, you, you can also get the coupled uh, temperature fields. And what happens is that temperature drives the formation of the up, upward currents. Right? So this is so temperature also has some useful information about uh, the upward currents in principle. Now, we would like to uh, we would like to make an agent learn to navigate these thermals. Right? And what we're going to do is to pose this agent in a reinforcement learning framework. So a reinforcement learning framework, you have an agent uh, going through a Markovian process. So it has a state space, and the states uh, satisfy the Markovian property, except that you have two additional features. You can influence your transition probabilities by taking actions. right? And for every action you take, you also get a reward. And the goal of a reinforcement learning agent is to maximize the expected sum of future rewards up to a certain horizon. So you have something called the Q, Q function, which is the expected sum of these rewards, and discounted with, with a gamma factor, right? And once you learn to estimate Q, you can derive a policy from there, which is the correct action to take given a state as the, as the action which maximizes this Q value. Now, the, the usefulness of reinforcement learning is that you learn basically from experience. Right? You, you sample, and this is totally model-free. So, the, so there's no information about Navier-Stokes or the aerodynamics given to the glider. So it's learning through samples. One thing which is different from supervised learning is that your samples, the, the samples that you collect depend on the policy that you use. Right? So you're not given a batch of samples, but instead you have to look for good samples. So it's an 
the, the sample collection process is an active process. So there's a trade-off called the exploration again, exploitation trade-off, which is implicit in uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Now in this case, uh, we have the states as the sensory information that the, that the glider is receiving or the bird is receiving, and you have the control angles, and the actions are the way you modify the angles, right? And the goal is to gain as much height as you can. Now you can, uh, you can put this, all of this together, and you can train this glider. So before training, you see certain random trajectories. It's taking random actions. It sinks on average. But after learning, you see that it begins to find thermals, and you see a spiraling uh, behavior that birds do as well. Right? You see the spiraling trajectories that birds uh, do as well. And now what you can do is you can basically play around with your state space. You can decide to give the glider certain kinds of information and not give it other kinds of information. So for instance, if you give it only the temperature, it doesn't learn anything. But if you give it the climb rate, it, does, it learns a little bit, but not much. It turns out that the mo two most important quantities are the rate of climb rate, which is the vertical acceleration, right? And the gradients of the velocity across the wings, right? So these two are the important quantities. And if you put these two together, you actually, they complement each other and you get a lot of uh, increase in performance. So what we can conclude from here is that in fact, the useful information, if you want to soar, is contained in the vertical wind accelerations and the gradients across the wind velocity gradients across the wings. What you can also observe is that the control over angle of attack is not useful. Right? So it doesn't it doesn't give any advantage if you inter, if you include angle of attack in your state space. Now you can. After training, you can come up with a policy. It's purposely uh, kept small so that it's not readable, because I'll be talking about it later in a later slide. But of course, the question that we want to answer is, how do birds measure these quantities? So now we have something that we can look for in experiments. But one thing you can ask is, how do these quantities are, how are these quantities measured by a bird, right? And can you, you can also ask if it still works in the field, if, if your algorithm still works in the field. So what we did was we went to the field, right? So what we did was we took a toy glider, RC plane. It's a two meter wingspan, right? So you can buy this in your favorite hobby store. Uh, you can equip them with a, a microcontroller. It's a flight controller which controls your plane. So if you ask it to maintain a particular bank angle, it's going to do it for you. So you can. You, you, you can set the desired bank angle, and it's going to track, it's going to control the plane so that it maintains that bank angle. And so you can do this very precisely. So what we did was we found a nice field uh, uh, 30 miles east of San Diego. Right? So we set up camp in the field, and we have a region of about a kilometer square. This is where we fly our planes. So the general strategy is we send the planes up, we turn on the learning algorithm, we let them fly, and learn how to navigate the currents, right? And they're collecting experiments, uh, they're collecting samples on the, on the fly. So now we can ask, uh, so when we're thinking of how birds uh, measure these quantities, essentially we are solving the same problem by asking how, how, how would you estimate these quantities on a glider, right? So if you can do it on a glider, we can, the bird can also do this. Now, if you want to estimate the vertical wind velocities, which is, you can take the derivative to get, to get the accelerations, what you actually get is the velocity, the vertical wind, uh, ground velocity which, with respect to the ground, which, which you get from the GPS and your barometer and so on, right? But you also have, if, and you want to get the glider, uh, the vertical wind velocity. So you need to subtract the, uh, the vertical velocity of the glider itself, right? And this turns out to be not so obvious, right? So you can you can write down what's the glider's motion related to still air, and it depends on the airspeed, the angle of attack, and the pitch of the glider. But what happens is that as the glider is flying, uh, if if it's steady flight, you have equilibrium. The lift balances the weight, and you have uh, you have steady flight. But when the glider turns, it's not in equilibrium anymore. 
So what you what the glider experiences are some kind of longitudinal instabilities called uh, fugoid oscillations. This is actually what you see even in uh, normal uh, commercial airplanes, except that the frequency is inversely proportional to the velocity. So it's very low frequency and controlled by the pilot. But in these kind of situations, if for a glider or a bird, it, it contributes significantly, right? Uh, so we had to take this into account, and we have other effects that we have to take into account, which, and we can do all of this, and ultimately get the vertical wind velocity and the acceleration from there. And you can verify that it's unbiased. Now this is, the acceleration is relatively easy. So let's, if you think about estimating wind gradients across the wings, this is much harder, right? So you have a bird or a glider one to two meters in wingspan, and you want to estimate wind velocity gradients across the wings. And it wasn't clear how we would do this. Right? So what we noticed, I mean, uh, what you can expect is that if you have a wind velocity gradient across the glider, then this is going to create some kind of torque on, on the glider, right? So it, it's going to create a roll-wise torque. And we observed as we were flying the glider that this glider would jitter. Right, you could see the you could see the glider uh, fluctuate in uh, its bank angle used to fluctuate, and we realized that we can use these fluctuations uh, in order to capture information about the torque generated by the wind. Okay, so if you look at the desired bank and the observed bank, the observed bank deviates by a few degrees from the desired bank. Right, so there's some useful information over here. So the change in bank, however, has contributions from the feedback control, which is used to control the plane. Uh, you have the aerodynamic effects, and you have the wind gradients that you want. So in general, you know you can measure this uh, using your instrumentation on the plane. This one you can model. It turns out that you can model all the aerodynamic effects on the glider, and you can subtract them out in order to get uh, the wind velocity, the vertical wind velocity gradient. And you can do this, and you can, you, you can show that you're getting an unbiased uh, measurements in your glider, right? And this can be done on board. So, so what we were doing to train the glider, again, was to send it up, let it collect samples. And once we have enough samples, uh, we know that it has converged. So you look at how the Q values have converged over time. So we do this for uh, over about 15 days of training time which is a total of about 15 hours of real time. And once, once you reach the convergence point, you can look at the policy that it has learned. This is a bit, uh, this is a bit um, complex, so I'll, I'll go through this more carefully. So here, you're looking at uh, three discretizations for each quantity. So the acceleration is discretized into three states. The, uh, the torque is discretized into three states, and this is basically zero torque, positive acceleration, zero torque, zero acceleration, and negative acceleration and zero torque, right? And the symbol tells, tells you what, how you should change the angle, right? So for instance, if you're at positive acceleration, so you're, you're going up, the optimal strategy is to maintain about in between 15 degrees and zero degrees. So turn, but slightly, right? So if you're at negative acceleration, uh, what you do is you bank away as much as possible. Right, which is intuitive, right? So if you if you're if you're going up the gradient, you keep going up the gradient. Uh, but if you're experiencing a negative gradient, you turn away. If you look at the states which uh, which are experiencing some kind of uh, wind velocity gradients, you can see that if if the glider is forced to bank to the right by the wind, then it it's it learns to turn to the left, right? And this kind of validates how we are estimating our, our roll-wise torques. So uh, what this says is basically that uh, given, given a positive torque, which pushes the glider to the right, you, you, you choose to bank to the left. But of course, there are certain details which also make intuitive sense. For instance, if you're, if you're experiencing a positive acceleration, you bank, but you don't bank as much, which you see here. Now we can you can uh, take this policy and put this in the glider, and we can see how well it does, right? So this is a this is an example trajectory that we got in the field. 
So the glider uh, starts from about 100 meters height and it goes all the way to 800 meters and there's actually cut off here. So it goes into the clouds and usually what uh, limits how far the glider can go is our receiver's range, right? So you can let it go as long as possible if you want. So it, it can stay, stay aloft for an hour without any, uh, without any engine. And you can also quantify this. You can, you can do repeated trials of three minutes each in the field. And you, you can get, show that you have some uh, significant improvement in, uh, in your, in your uh, policy. Now the question that you can ask is, how is this possible, right? So you, if you're a bird and you're estimating wind gradients across a wingspan of uh, length uh, one, one to two meters, right? So suppose, suppose you're uh, going across a Gaussian shaped thermal, right? So you have an updraft which is shaped like a Gaussian. You would expect that your torques scale with the wingspan, right? Because you're estimating the gradient and so you would expect that a longer, uh, longer wingspan, and that's you're going to get a scaling proportional to L. But of course, uh, in the atmosphere, what you have is turbulence. So you have eddies of different length scales. Right? So, in general, if you have a glider, if you have a bird, uh, you, it's being the eddies, the turbulent eddies generate torques on on the glider, right? And the eddy that generates the most torque is this is the eddy of the size of the bird itself. So the larger eddies, what they what they do is they have a sweeping effect. They simply translate the translate the bird. But if you have uh, and smaller eddies are weaker. So it, it's three D turbulence. So you uh, the stronger eddies have much uh, have higher higher energy in them. So the the most influential eddies are the ones of the scale of the glider itself. And it turns out that for turbulence, the magnitude of the eddies of size of the wingspan scales as L to the one third, right? So this is the magnitude of the noise. But as you, as the bird goes along for a time t, so it travels a, a distance of vt, what it crosses are uh, L distinct eddies of size L, right? So it's making only vt over L independent measurements. So if you're calculating your signal to noise ratio, it's going to be L divided by the noise times square root of the number of independent measurements that you're making. So essentially what you have is a signal to noise ratio which scales as L to the one sixth, right? So it's a pretty weak scaling. It's not, uh, so it's not very useful to have a larger wingspan, right? And you can do a similar calculation for the acceleration and you can show that it scales as Vt to the two thirds. And this comes from the same idea that as you go along as you go, as, as the bird goes along a distance of Vt, you're getting noise from an eddy of size Vt, which is of strength Vt to the one third. You can do the calculation uh, more carefully and you can plot the signal to noise ratio as a function of wingspan. Uh, you can show that, so what we have is reasonable, right? So if you, if you, put, in, if you put in the numbers, uh, you can show that the signal to noise ratio for the accelerations is, is order one and, and for torques as well. So the conclusion is that birds do have enough information to estimate uh, vertical wind velocity gradients across their wings. So what we have right now is a way, is, is a proposal for what cues a bird can use for soaring, right? So, but birds would probably use something more complex, but the idea is that uh, wind accelerations and torques will be useful for any other strategy. And of course, you can ask, how do you infer the strategies of birds from uh, data, right? And this, this approaches uh, something called inverse reinforcement learning, right? So basically, you have to infer the behavior of agents just by looking at their decisions. And this is, this is in general, a hard problem. Now, this kind of approach can be applied to many other problems. So, I mean, we have many different biological phenomena that you can apply this approach to. But there are lots of interesting questions in uh, uh, the theory of reinforcement learning itself, right? You can ask how much you explore, uh, how much you explore different kind of strategies before you choose the best one, right? So this is uh, the exploration exploitation trade-off again. And in general, there's a lot of questions regarding how you choose your state space, so your, uh, your, the choice of representation, uh, and it, the field is entirely open, I think. 
and there's a lot of applications uh, in video games and uh, chess and Go and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of theory to be done. Thank you.